Hi everybody, Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical precious metals brokerage house specializing in gold and silver. Well, you might have heard Janet Yellen's speech the other day where she just does not understand why they can't generate more inflation the traditional way. Well, aside from the fact that they've been doing all these extraordinary things, I thought I would help Janet out a little bit today. So I'm going to show you why. Simply, very simply put. But you've seen this chart before from the Federal Reserve, the purchasing power of the dollar, which is down to four cents. And truthfully, there is no more purchasing power left. Now, as the purchasing power and the value declined, so did interest rates. So you've got more than 90% of the industrialized world that are anchored in zero or somewhere near zero interest rates. And there have been some experiments in the negative world. But the problem is, is that cash is preventing them from going too far below zero. So simply put, the reason why they can't generate the inflation that they want, though you and I experience that in our day-to-day -day lives, is because there's virtually no purchasing power left. They have to attack principal and cash is stopping them. But they have been experimenting with that. And Sweden has been leading the pack. And part of the reason why Sweden has been as successful in removing cash from their system as they have been is because it's a small country, they have four key banks, and those banks are very cooperative with each other. So in 2009, in the midst of the crisis, Sweden was the first uh, central bank ever to experiment with negative rates, to take those, those rates negative. And in 2010, at that point, 40% of retail transactions were cash transactions. They encouraged the use of digital currencies, which is the rise that you see right here. And as that happened, you can see the fall in the use of cash, so much so that the most current data that I could find on it, which was 2015, only 15% of retail transactions are now cash transactions. So Sweden is the closest to being cashless, or you could say they're certainly using a whole lot less cash. And their central bank, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, is also likely to be the first one. They're, they seem to be further along than anybody else in having a central bank crypto coin. But not to be outdone by any of this, I don't think that it's a coincidence that they are now voluntarily um, injecting some employees with these microchips because after all, it is so much more convenient to wave your hand and buy something from a vending machine or open a door or what have you. So let's all keep this in mind as we move forward with Sweden. And we're going to come back to Sweden in a minute. So the problem is the cash. Let's decash. And in January of this year, yep, oh, sorry, March of this year, the IMF wrote a working paper on decaching. Now, I know that you have this up there on your screen, but not everybody likes to do this. And this is such an important piece out of that that I'm going to read it to you. And then I'm going to encourage you also to follow the links that we post for all of these um, images and go in and read the whole report. It's really interesting and really telling. But they need perception management because they want you to accept this easily. In fact, they want you to volunteer it. So they prefer a private sector led decaching private sector, and that's preferable to a public sector or a government-led decaching. Remember, they just tested that in November in India, and they say the former seems almost benign, more use of mobile phones to pay for coffee, but still needs poli policy adaptation. In other words, it still has to be legalized, it still has to be regulated. The latter seems more questionable. So if the governments bring this out, that's more questionable. And people may have valid objections to it. 
Uh huh, I have those. Decaching of either kind leaves both individuals and states more vulnerable to disruptions ranging from power outages to hacks to cyber warfare. In any case, the tempting attempts to impose decaching by a decree should be avoided. Yeah, they did that in India, they did that in Venezuela, they see the results of that. A targeted outreach program is needed to alleviate suspicions related to decaching. They don't want me or you to be suspicious about what their real intentions are, and then they lay out those intentions. In particular, that by decaching, the authorities are trying to control all aspects of people's lives, including their use of money or push personal savings into banks. They say the decaching process would acquire more traction if it were based on, here we go folks, individual consumer choice. Now, that's how they get you to volunteer. If you choose to go into the coffee shop and wave your phone or your hand, if you're chipped, to buy that coffee, then that's your choice. They're not foisting it on you. So this is perception management. You can see it right here. So they have a plan, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Because a lot of people think that all of this cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and blockchain and DLT and smart contracts are new. Well, no, they're not. In 1996, the NSA, which is the National Security Association, came out with a white paper which outlined basic, the basic design of cryptocurrencies. This and it is an index from that white paper. And again, you'll have all the links to this. Go in, do your due diligence on it. But what I found really interesting in this index is how many of the terminology and the concepts that we think are new and outside of the system today, but they're outlined right here. Specifically, electric, electronic payment, public key cryptographic tools, untraceable electronic payments, authentication and signature techniques, transferability, divisibility, and oh, I like this last one, wallet observers. Now, those are the same terms that you hear all the time in the crypto space. I don't think it's an accident that they discussed it in those terms in 96. But then, and I knew about this one. This one in 97, let me tell you, when this popped up and I saw what this was, I did a happy dance because I didn't know that this existed. But in 1997, a year later, uh, there was a peer review that came out outlining or basically designing smart contracts. So there you go, guys. 96, 97, cryptocurrencies, smart contracts. The foundation is laid for this next program. Now, the interesting thing about that is urban legend has it that it was Satoshi Nakamoto who is a really mysterious figure. He came out and, and uh, Bitcoin was born in 2009. Now, what was else was happening in 2009? Gosh, we were at the depth of the crisis and they started doing quantitative easing, all this massive amount of money printing in, on March 9th of 2009. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. You, I mean, it could be, I can't actually prove that, but there are no coincidences and you just saw the evidence of when they were first discussing it. And you remember if you've watched enough of these videos that I've said that the system died in 2008 and they put it on life support with all of these extraordinary measures that Janet Yellen doesn't seem to understand why are they aren't working, but they put the system on life support till they could get the new money standard in place. So not, not a, a surprise that Bitcoin came out in 2009, and I don't think it was a coincidence either. 
but they had to work out the bugs and they had to generate acceptance in the system. And that does take a little bit of time. So in 2016, the IMF came out with a staff discussion note paper on virtual currencies initial considerations. And I really want you to pay a lot of attention to this box down here because there are those that think that the central banks will just roll over and give up their power. Hey, but guess what? They've been in, they've been in control. The earliest one was in the United Kingdom and that's who exported their central bank here to us. But since 1694, so you really think that the central banks are going to go, well, yeah, we've been in power since 1694. We've had our run. We're good. It's your turn now. I don't think so. And they don't think so either. That's a big consideration for them. It's in that report. You'll have the link. In addition, people think that these cryptocurrencies go around the system. I hope you can see they're part of it because they also know how to, you know, here, here we go. What is it? Regulating digital currencies. This is 2013. Regulating digital currencies, bringing Bitcoin within the reach of the IMF. And this was put out by the Chicago Journal of International Law. I mean, this is not, none of this is a coincidence, okay? Now, on the 17th of this month, the Bank for International Settlements, so the central banks of central banks, came out with central bank cryptocurrencies, okay? Now, they do admit that this, or the risks could not yet be fully assessed because you need to understand there's, tons. It's all experimentation at this point. It's all experimentation. So they cannot assess the risks, nor do they really know. Um, well, they haven't really experienced a crisis in this arena yet, but there will be because it's all experimental. But in this paper, and this is what we're going to show you today, and then I'm going to bring it back again to show you how, where it fits. This paper is a taxonomy of money and it's based on those four key elements. So we're going to look at who the issuer is, whether it's a central bank or other, the form of it, whether it's electronic or physical, whether it's accessibility universal, so everybody gets to use it, or limited use, um, which they also refer to in this paper as retail being universal and wholesale being just bank use. And then the transfer mechanism, whether that's centralized or decentralized. So that's out of this biz piece. And um, again, great piece. Read it for yourself. But what they gave us was the money flower. And this is an example of what it will look like for them. Now, this blue outline circle here is central bank issued currencies. Um, and monies of all different kinds. What I want to point out to you is that you can see there are a bunch of things in this, but you can see how the central bank overlaps in all other areas, peer to peer, universally, and this is, this is really key in here, universally acceptable and then electronic. But the central bank covers every single one of those areas. Now, Additional testing has been done in DCA right here. This would be central bank issued cryptocurrencies to the public. Uh, I'm going to read this so I get it right. But Dinero Electronico is a mobile payment service in Ecuador. And so the central bank actually provides uh, directly that money to the public. So they have been testing that scheme and they are discussing the fact that the central bank would issue the money directly. Right now, it goes through um, the key banks. So like Chase, all of the commercial banks, Chase, Wells Fargo, the big guys, okay? But in their proposal, they're showing how they could actually issue um, e-money directly to the public. They also show you, now right here, this is the Fed coin, so that's where the Federal Reserve fits in. This is the CAD coin, so that is the Canadian uh, crypto 
possible. It's underlined, so it's still in the works. Uh, but the uh, Canadian central bank coin, and you can see Sweden coming back in here, and they put that on the line specifically because, as they said, uh, Sweden is the closest to issuing the first central bank, a uh, good central bank uh, cryptocurrency. But the other piece that I really want to point out is right here, precious metal coins. Okay, and what I want you to keep in mind, there were those four things that they wanted us to pay attention to, okay? This is not issued. This, this, not issued by any central bank. It is in physical form. Let's see, what's the other one? Okay, it is universal. This is universal money. You can go anywhere in the world and instantly have the same level of purchasing power no matter where you go. And it is a true form of decentralized money. There's nobody that really controls it. They control the paper of it, okay? So keep this in mind that the four areas, properties that they wanted to pay attention to, look at where they fall. Okay, peer-to-peer, -peer, universal, and guess what? Outside of, of, most of it is outside of the realm of the central bank. There you go, folks. They're telling you we need, to, we need to start believing what they say. But the other one that I wanted to point out right here is the utility settlement coin, which is a very big deal. Now, Rory over at... Um, I'm sorry, at the, at the Daily Coin, he's written extensively about the utility settlement coin. We're gonna give you some links to some of his articles so you can get into that more. But simply put, these major banks are pushing for this and they intend to go into live uh, testing of it in 2018. And we're hearing that year, 2018, a lot uh, coming up for the new monies. But what it does is it digitized, and we just know that the SEC had a major hack in their system. So this all falls into it. I don't think it's a coincidence that they happened to bring it up, uh, you know, within the last two days. But this would take all of those intangible assets and digitize them, and then they could be converted into cash at the central bank. Okay? So... This is a very big deal. Go find out more about it. I will probably do something on this and a few others um, in more detail. But it absolutely is placed on their flower. So they're paying a lot of attention to it. And it matters a big deal. It's a big deal. And you see all the push on these big banks. Not to mention that, but they also need greater acceptance. So City came out and they said, well, we have to get the backing of the states. And if we can get the backing of the states, that's really going to supercharge global uh, or local acceptance of these cryptocurrencies. Well, I live in Arizona. Thank goodness Arizona recently passed a law making these or redesignating these as good money because Arizona also passed the very first law, let's see, Arizona passes ground baking blockchain and smart contract law. So we're the first ones. However, there's lots and lots of legislation that's coming, that's coming through right now. So you see there is a lot more adoption of this. And how much are they really even talking about it? I mean, they're, they want you to see the price of the cryptocurrencies to go up so that you can accept it. But can you see how they're laying all the groundwork? Because here's some more of it. This is Hyperledger, which is another very big deal. Here are a bunch of their, not all of them, but a bunch of their members. And the two particularly that I want to po point out to you is DTCC. Because we've talked about DTC, whether you hear it as DTC, DTCC, or Seed and Company, that's these guys, okay? And they are the legal registered owner of almost every single fiat money product on the planet. You, if you have a, an account at, you know, Schwab or 
wherever, you know, one of the brokerage houses. It's held in street name, so you're the beneficial owner. But the legal registra registered owner is right here, and they're a member of Hyperledger. Also, SWIFT. Now, SWIFT actually stands for, you might have heard of them, but because they're huge, but the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. That's what SWIFT stands for. And they actually prov provide an interbank global network for money transfers between banks and central banks all over the world. They too have been hacked, okay? But they are a member right here. And you may have also heard, um, like if we're putting sanctions on a country like Iran or North Korea, that we, that they lose access to the SWIFT system. And that's been a huge club that we've bludgeoned other countries against. And they don't like it, so China came up with an alternative. But that's another discussion for another day. The point is is that you can see this move. The foundation is being laid in and we aren't really hearing a whole lot about it unless you're really focused in this arena. Going back to the smart contracts. Here you go on seven, what, 26? Okay, so July 26th of 17, this article came out and here you go. You have the very first legal smart contract and it's with who? Oh, Hyperledger, okay? Can you see how all of these dots are really connected? Because this is happening whether we want it to or not. What we can make a difference of is the choice on the other side of this mess, okay? And I'm gonna to come to that in a second, but I wanna talk a little bit about China because we do know that China has chosen, the, the IMF has chosen China rather, to spearhead the shift to the SDR and, and they are also committed to spearheading the shift to the cryptocurrencies. Um, so much so that people are more used to, if you go to China, they're more used to buying things with their phone. They, a lot of places won't accept cash anymore. So China as a technocratic government is committed to this. But they recently banned all ICOs and they also shut down all of the exchanges. Though at the same time that they did that, they continued to encourage the continued development of the smart contract. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, of the blockchain technology. And they are very, very close themselves to their central bank issuing um, a cryptocurrency. So it's just that they want to control it. They are technocratic, okay? And technocrats don't care about the individuals as much as they care about the system. It's all about the system. And if the Chinese Communist Party says you will do this, you will do that. And by the way, um, going, we're gonna be talking a lot more about this, but the China's, Chinese Communist Party has a meeting in October that lays out their plans for the next five years. That's a very big deal. They are committed to this blockchain technology, but they want to control it. And remember, they've also issued the first um, quantum satellite in space that has actually been tested and works. So they're in control of it, and they've also done that with a con uh, quantum submarine to lay a grid out in all the ocean floors. We'll talk more about that uh, with a guest I have coming in the future, um, not too distant future. Okay, so that's China and a little bit more. Uh, if you saw the Q&A, you already saw this yesterday, but I did have people ask me, since I brought out the Oc chain and everybody wanted to poo-poo it, I still only see them as being tied to the SDR, but people were curious, oh, well, China shut down the exchanges and China um, banned the ICOs, so that must be not right with Octchain. But the interesting thing is, there's a lot of interesting pieces in here. Octchain has been trading in Japan, Canada, and Korea, so they have not been trading in China. I'm going to Twitter with them and see if I can find out why they weren't ever on the exchange in China, but since that's where they're located, but I think that's kind of interesting. Okay, in addition, 
they say that Octchain is a blockchain tool to do asset digitiz digitization. So the cryptocurrencies that we're talking about don't have, they're not digitizing anything. They're just ether, they're just air, they're just algorithms. But with Octchain, they're digitizing physical assets. If they can, physical assets. So that also makes it a little bit different for uh, China because China banned the cryptocurrencies. And they also say as an open source blockchain, they have many nodes all over the world. So you've got to think about all of this stuff has nodes. All of this stuff goes through uh, networks of computers. And that's a huge infrastructure. So it's not as invisible and around the system as a lot of people want to think. And I want to say this too. I can see a lot of good things in this technology. I mean, having the ability, if there's some kind of outbreak and having the ability to go all the way back to see specifically what farm was next to what pig farm or, and, and why people got salmonella and all of that. I mean, I can see the good in it, but I can also see the bad in it. And I know that it's inevitable but I want us to have choice. I don't want everything on a little chip in my hand. And especially me, I'm 63. That doesn't really mean that much more for my life. But my grandson is four. My granddaughter's two and a half. It matters for them more than anybody. It matters for the generations to come. So I'm going to come back to that in a second. But let me show you how far they've come. Because from 2009, when Bitcoin first came out, this is out from Coindesk. This is uh, the second annual report on blockchain technology. And this is the Google searches on that, on Bitcoin. Let's see, blockchain, nearly every blockchain related term hit all time global uh, Google search interest. And you can see how that was ratcheted up. Well, sure, the higher the price goes, the more visibility it gets, the more excitement surrounds it because people get suckered in. Perception management. And we can see that right here as well in the, in the market cap of the cryptocurrencies, right? They want that big. They want you to see it because all of that generates more acceptance of it. And, you know, shortly after Sweden injected those, uh, those microchips into employees at that one company, well, we followed suit here. And right now it's voluntary, but once they hit a critical mass, then it becomes mandatory. And, you know, I really don't want to sound weird about this, honestly, but this is what popped into my head when I was working on this, so I'm going to have to tell you my thoughts on it. And that is how we originally voluntarily chipped our dogs and our cats. And most of that happened in the 90s, from what I could tell. And it was voluntary. Now it's mandatory in most places around the world. But living with those animals and, you know, and for, for a lot of people, dogs and cats, I mean, they're our babies. And so now we have this close relationship with these animals that we voluntarily or like I have a tendency to adopt my animals. So it's not even like I would even have a choice on whether or not they're chipped. They come to me chipped. But, you know, I mean, we got used to that. And so what's the next step is, of course, to chip humans. Now I know that they tested it in two, back in 2004, but now we're looking at it on a much bigger scale. So from the IMF, what they don't want us to have suspicions about related to decaching, that the authorities are trying to control all aspects of people's lives. And their preference is for it to be an individual choice to voluntarily give up this don't volunteer it. Use more cash. I am. I am. I heard myself talking. I realized that I was using my debit card more than cash. 
and I stop that. We have to band together. We have to use more cash. The cash will not protect your purchasing power. For that, you need the gold and the silver, but it will at least make it more challenging for them. If there's more cash in use, it's harder to take out of the system. And as you read, that they would like the tempting attempts to impose a decaching by decree should be avoided. They've tested that. They've seen the pushback. They want us to volunteer. Don't volunteer. So you need a certain level of cash and you need to be using more cash in your daily lives. I just want you to realize that this is a piece of paper. It's a debt instrument. It is not about protecting your purchasing power. It can be destroyed easily. It can burn up. It can blow away. But this can't. This is real money. Your gold, your silver, I can't tear it. I can't bend it. It would break my teeth. Okay. Real tangible money outside of the system, truly decentralized, truly decentralized. So that's it for today. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. And really I'm tweeting every day. So, and I'm tweeting out different articles. So please do and subscribe to us on YouTube. If you like this, give us a thumbs up. Please make sure to share this. Everybody needs to know this information. Follow those links that we've put in there. Do your own due diligence. I think in these, in these biz reports and these IMF reports, they're a lot more candid. They're a lot more honest about their intentions because they know not many people go and read them read them. They're a reasonably easy read. And if you have questions, give us a call 888-696-4653. And honestly, we're all here. We all pay attention. We all read this stuff. So I'm sure that anybody you get will easily be able to answer your questions. And if they can't, we work as a team. So I'm here and I'm available. So you take care out there and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Be safe.